Man, it's so good to see you guys, your smiling faces, and um, there's nothing like being in the presence of the Lord, worshiping with you. If we haven't met before, my name is Adam, and I'd love to meet you at the end of service today. Also, I'd like to encourage you, if your first time, come over here to Next Steps. We're going to get some stuff in your hand tell you all about a journey and what the Lord is doing. I want to encourage you right now, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, this is where we're going to be. Uh, this morning, while you turn there uh, in your Bibles, we are concluding this series today. Uh, next week uh, will be a, a guest speaker, a Sergey. He's from Israel, a pastor from Israel. Be really, really great to hear from him. Uh, and then we're going to start a new series on uh, the Book of James. So I'm very excited about the fall series. And uh, have you enjoyed this series, though, so far this summer? Bring the heat. It's been really, really good to hear from different people. Amen. How many ready for God's word today? Come on, say let's go. Romans chapter 8. It says this. There is therefore now. I love that. Now, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free, free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness or the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. How many of you are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit? Come on. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. For the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. I've entitled my message this morning, Back to the Basics. Back to the basics. How many of you know that, man, sometimes the basics are the most powerful thing? That unless you understand the basics, you're not going to be effective. I think even about basketball, I'm encouraging my son right now, hey, learn the fundamentals because the fundamentals matter. The basics really matter. You're not going to succeed unless you have the basics. Back to the basics this morning. Uh, if you'd like my notes, you can text notes to the number that's on the screen and what's in front of me will be sent to you. Let's pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. God, we come here this morning empty of ourselves, wanting you and you alone, Jesus. God, your word is active, it is breathing, it is sharper than any two edged sword. Your word is truth, it is infallible. Lord, it leads us, it directs us, it guides us. And so, Lord, as we open your word today, God, I beg you and I ask you, God, would you breathe upon it? Would you make it alive? Would you take your Logos word and make it rhema in us? God, we say to you as we often pray, as I often pray, God, Lord, we are your servants and we are listening. We are listening, Jesus, so speak. 
Speak to us, God. May we receive from you exactly what you have for us this morning. And everyone said in this place this morning, come on, someone. Amen, amen, amen. amen. You know, uh, one of my favorite places in the entire world is North Carolina. I don't know about you, but whenever I go to the mountains, I call it God's country. Like, is this something about North Carolina? Is something about the, the, uh, the, the crisp air in the middle of winter or in the fall? It just, uh, it's so refreshing, especially being down here in Florida and the humidity we're experiencing right now. Can I get an amen? Amen. My parents live up there just about 30 minutes south of, of Asheville. So I love going up there and visiting. And... We grew up going on this one hike. It's called Black Boss and Knob. It's in the Appalachian Mountains. It's one of the tallest peaks in the Appalachian Mountains in this area. And this hike is a little bit on the strenuous side, but the, the, the difficulty of the hike is so worth it. Because when you get to the top uh, and you've kind of cleared the, the trees and the, you go through the hike and there's trees at the very beginning, you get to the pinnacle, you get to the top, and all of a sudden there's no more trees and you can see everything around you. Like all the trees are gone and there's 360 all the way around is just beauty. You can see just the beauty of the Lord and the beauty of the Appalachian Mountains. As a matter of fact, I think there's some pictures that they've got of this hike so you can just get a, a feel for it. So like all the trees are gone at the top. Go to the next one. Just keep scrolling through there. So you can just see how, that's my family. That's my dad and my son. You can just see how incredible all the way around the beauty of the Lord is when you get up there to experience his creation and it is the pinnacle in that area. Like it is the top. It is, is it. In my mind is the best hike. Theologians, they say this about Romans chapter 8, that it is the pinnacle of all scripture. Like nowhere do you find the beauty and the wonder and the height, the width, the breadth of God's love than right here in Romans chapter 8. Like it is, it is it. It is the pinnacle of all scripture. Matter of fact, some theologians, and I'm no theologians, but they, they were, Martin Luther, he writes this and he says, Romans is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word, by heart, but occupy himself with it every day. As the daily bread of the soul, it can never be read or pondered too much. And the more it is dealt with, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this about chapter 8. He says, it is one of the brightest gems of all. Someone has said that in the whole of scriptures, the brightest and the most lustrous and flashing stone or collection of stones is this epistle to the Romans. And that chapter 8 is the brightest gem in the cluster. The most moving chapter in Romans is this chapter, chapter 8. It's all found here in the word of God in chapter 8 here in one place. It is the pinnacle of the beauty and the love of God. Now, to understand, though, Romans chapter 8, you've got to go and you've got to look back at the rest of Romans and see Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, Paul writes this, and he is a Christian at the time. We can all agree upon that. Paul is a Christian when he writes this. And he writes things like, why do I do the things that I don't want to do, and I do them anyways, and I have no desire to do them, but yet I still do them? Does anybody else just feel that way sometimes about your life? And he's writing, why am I doing this? Paul's saying, I've got some issues. I don't know about you in this room, but I've just got to tell you this morning, I personally, I've got some issues. I've got issues. You've got issues. We've all got issues Let's just break the ice right now here this morning. Tap your neighbor and say, I've got some issues. Come on, y'all. We all got some issues. It's okay to admit. You don't have to agree with the person next to you now. Okay, husbands, don't agree with your spouse with that, you know. You're making a mistake if you do that. We've all got some issues. Every single one of us in this room. I mean, Paul, the one who wrote half of the New Testament, he's saying, I do these things that I don't want to do, and I do them in me anyways. And then he makes this statement. He says, wretched man that I am. 
In other words, there is no good thing found in me. Wretched man that I am. Why is all of this junk and all of this stuff in my heart? Why do I keep on doing these things I don't want to do, even though I do them anyways? I don't understand, wretched man that I am. This is where Paul is at here in Romans chapter 7, and he writes this. And he makes this statement. He says, who will deliver me? Not what will deliver me. Not how can I deliver myself, because we can't deliver ourselves. But he says, who will deliver me? And in verse 25, he writes and he says, thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the answer is not us. The answer is not someone else. The answer is thanks be to Jesus. Thanks be to Jesus. This is who and what will deliver me. It is Christ and Christ alone, not myself, not my parents, not anyone else. It is Christ. And so the beauty that's found here, the only way to truly understand it is to understand the tension that Paul is in, the angst of this moment as he writes this wretched man that I am. I've got nothing to offer that's any good. There's this tension, but then chapter 8 comes. Chapter 8 comes, and what does he say? Therefore, this word therefore Why is therefore there? Because therefore, because of all this stuff, chapter 7 and the previous chapters, he's able to write now, therefore. The therefore is everything before that. Therefore, now. And I love this. I mean, this should set you free this morning, I'm telling you. He says, therefore, now. Not Someday, not when I've got my act together, not when everything is working out. He says, therefore, now, now, in the two most incredible words I can find in all of Scripture, and it really sums up chapter 8 right here. He says, now, no condemnation. Therefore, now, because I am wretched because I've got some issues, because of all of this sin I'm walking through. Therefore, now, there is no condemnation. No condemnation. That should give you reason to breathe for a moment, sit back, and man, I don't have to make it work out on my own because there is therefore now no condemnation. Condemnation, when we use this word, it's used oftentimes in the legal sense. And it means this, by definition, it means no charge, no debt. No charge, no debt. For the grand judgment of your life, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no charge and there is no debt. (laughs) Let that just wash over you for a moment. There's no charge and no debt. Most of us feel very differently though, don't we? Most of us feel so much condemnation because of things in which we've done in our life. But because of the cross, because of Jesus, because of Calvary, because of what he's done for you, there is no charge and there is no debt. I said this earlier that most of the time, this is used as a, this term is actually a legal term, but most of the time when we use this, it's, we use it in the building sense. So when you look at it in the building sense, and you look at a building that is under condemnation or a building that is condemned, it's as if, you know, someone comes along, they slap a sticker on the building and say, it is unfit for use. Don't use that building, don't walk into it. There's some yellow tape around it. It is unfit for use. And most of us, don't we feel this way about our own lives, that we are unfit for use because of things in which we've done? Back about uh, seven years ago, when we were moving from Fort Caroline area over here to Orange Park area, uh, I was on staff at another church across town, came over here as the worship pastor about seven years ago, a little over that. And so we were selling a house to move a little closer to the church. And for me, you know, I, I feel like I can try anything. Um, if there's a YouTube video for it, I just sign on and figure it out. You know what I mean? 
So I decided to sell my house for sell by owner because I had time. It wasn't really that big of a deal. I could continue to commute over here and all that. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to sell uh, by owner and save on realtor fees. So I go through the whole process uh, with that. And we agree upon the sale of my home. And what happens is I get back the inspection report, right? And with the inspection report, when we get that back, I mean, there is a laundry list of things for my house that I need to fix. Now, right before that, just kind of give you some context for it, I had just had to fix the entire roof because it was leaking in my daughter's room. I remember when I was, uh, uh, when we were there, my daughter was probably four or five years old at the time, and in the middle of the night when it would rain, she'd look up and say, Daddy, my, my ceiling's leaking. And I'd be like, I don't really know what to do in this situation. I tried everything, tried to patch it. We didn't have the money to fix it in the cutest little voice. And I feel like almost like, I don't know. You ever been there before? You don't know how to fix something in your house. You don't have the money for it and you're struggling. And my beautiful, wonderful daughter, she's looking up saying, hey, it's right in my room, daddy. (laughs) And so uh, we get this laundry list back after we had just fixed the roof and come to find out that the plumbing underneath was all cast iron and had to be completely replaced. Like everything underneath it was breaking and going bad. We then uh, had to also replace the septic tank because it was going bad as well. And so not only did we have these big, huge items that we had to fix, but we had another just knick-knack things because it was an older house. And so the buyers are like, man, I want to back out this house is unfit for use. There's no way I'm moving into this. And I just kind of said, hey, wait for a moment. You know, we'll work on figuring this out. I've got to fix it anyways. Let me fix it. You'll have everything updated and you can move in. So we talked with them and they decided, okay, we're going to fix it. And they decided to continue forward with the cell. But in that moment, I was thinking to myself, okay, I've had my incredible, precious, amazing family in this home, and this home has been unfit for use and has been breaking, and everything has been going wrong with it. This building, this house in which I have been putting my family in for the longest time, it is unfit for use. And isn't that exactly what the enemy whispers in our ear? He says to us, You're unfit for use, you're no good. No one's with you. No one's behind you. No one loves you. And he'll whisper these things to you. He'll whisper these things, and it almost feels like it's truth to you as well. He'll whisper these things and say, you've messed up way too much. You've done way too much. There's no hope for you. Just give up already. Just stop. And the thing about as the enemy attacks, he knows exactly where to attack you. And he'll whisper these things over your life. And what will happen is your feelings will justify what he's whispering to you because you'll feel that way. You'll feel this condemnation because it lines up the way you feel. How many know, though, we can't listen to our feelings? We cannot listen to our feelings. What stops and changes the way you feel? Facts change the way you feel, right? Facts change the way you feel. For my house, I said to the owners or the people who are buying, the buyers, hey, I'll fix all these things and they'll be up to speed and up to par and you'll be able to move into the house because they really wanted it. So that fact that I would fix everything changed the way they felt about the home. Remember back during COVID, they would say facts over fear? (laughs) Facts over fear, I'm telling you though, they were just pushing out fear. They're pushing out half-truths. But let me give you this example. Say you have a really, your best friend, they get in a car accident, and someone tells you that they died. And you're grieving in that moment, and you're crying, and someone comes up to you, and they tell you in that moment, it's going to be okay. And you're like, it's not going to be okay at all. What are you talking about? Sometimes Christians say the dumbest things. Uh, it's going to be okay. And you're like, no, it's not going to be okay. I'm grieving. I've lost my closest friend. But then you tell them, no, it is going to be okay. I just saw them. They might have gotten that car wreck, but I saw uh, the police pull them out, and they were walking. 
No, they're alive. No, they're going to be okay. Like, they're alive. And all of a sudden, this feeling of what you thought you've lost your closest friend comes over you because the facts change the way you feel in that moment. Here's the facts. The facts is here in this word. It is unfallible. It does not uh, compromise itself. There is so much truth in this word. And the facts is this. The facts is now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, you can go to the word of God and you can stand on the word of God. You can say, here are the facts. And maybe not overnight, but maybe over you know, a period of time, the facts will change the way you feel. That's why Paul talks about renew your mind daily. That's why we go to the word, we go to scripture, and it changes the way we feel. It changes our perspective. It changes our thought process. And the facts are this, that now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You might be saying, Adam, you don't understand. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've gone through. I've done some pretty awful things. Maybe you've walked through an awful divorce. And it's been difficult. Maybe someone has done something really horrible to you. And it's been hard to really walk through that storm. Maybe you've committed adultery before. Maybe you, right now you're addicted to drugs or addicted to pornography, addicted to food, addicted to something else. But here's the truth of the matter is therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Receive that this morning. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But here's the, here's the question I have for you this morning. Are you in Christ Jesus? Are you in Christ Jesus? This is the question. Are you in Christ Jesus? I'm not just talking about one part of you. I'm talking about every part of you. Oftentimes we'll surrender some parts to the Lord, but not other parts. We're holding back this thing from God. Hey, God, you can have this part, but Lord... This is mine. I'm going to hold on to it and I'm going to do what my flesh wants me to do. What God is saying, give me all of you. Or is all of you in Christ Jesus? Are you in Christ Jesus? That is the question this morning. Are you in Christ Jesus? Look at verse 2. It says this. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Come on, say, Jesus has made me free. <laughs> Come on, say, Jesus has made me free. Lean into that. Free from what? Free from the law of sin and death. Free from the law of sin in death. Listen, if you are in Christ, if you have surrendered your life to Christ, there is freedom. Freedom not in of yourself, but freedom in the spirit of God. Because Christ, he dwells in you. And you might be saying, Adam, there is a war, there is a battle, and I would absolutely agree. But listen, Christ lives within you. And because Christ lives within you, he has given you the strength, he has given you the, the courage. He's given you the ability to overcome sin. He has defeated death, hell, and the grave so that you can have freedom and life and liberty through his spirit, not in and of yourself, but only through him. And I know what the end of the book says. The end of the book says he wins. And because we are in Christ, we have victory. There is freedom at the foot of the cross. There is freedom in Jesus. And what this freedom gives you is you don't have to pretend any longer. We don't have to pretend like we got it all together. We don't have to pretend that we're not in the same shoes as what, what Paul was when he was a Christian. He was writing this wretched man that I am. 
We don't have to pretend like we're these perfect people here in church because none of us are. We're only made righteous, not in of ourselves, but through Christ. So we no longer have to pretend. And the beauty of this as well is that you don't have to perform. Some of us in this room, we try to perform for Christ. We try to do all the right things. And because there's freedom, because the spirit of God lives within you, you don't have to pretend any longer. You don't have to perform. You simply just yield to the Lord. Look at this next part now. Verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. God did. Who? God. You didn't. I certainly didn't. Your parents didn't. Only God did. How? By sending his only son. By sending his only son. Can you imagine giving up one of your kids so that others could have freedom? That's exactly what Jesus did for us when his father sent him. Rule keeping, rule keeping by means of justification cannot save you. The only thing that saves you is what? It's Jesus. I want to give you three quick things that religious rule keeping does. Number one, religious rule keeping, it leads to pride. Religious rule keeping, it leads to pride. It leads to thinking, man, I can do this on my own. I've got this. I can do it. I don't need Christ. Religious rule keeping leads to pride. The second thing it leads to is religious rule keeping leads to exhaustion. The third thing is religious rule keeping leads to hopelessness. Being a Christian is not about sin management. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Sin management is what a bunch of us have been brought up in. It's what a bunch of us started off our relationship with the Lord in, trying to perform, trying to manage our sin, trying to just do and overcome sin on our own. You see, the grace of God is this. The grace of God is not a license to sin. The grace of the Lord allows you to overcome sin. It is God's mercy that forgives you. His grace allows you not to have to do sin management, but allows you to walk in the freedom of the Spirit of God that lives within you. So no longer do we have to try to manage our sin, but because of Christ and his Spirit living within us, we can overcome. And what sin management does, as I said, it leads to exhaustion. And you'll try to overcome the sin in your own ability, in your own might. And then all of a sudden you're left, man, why do I keep on doing this? I didn't want to do it and here I am again. And now you feel even more guilty. It's this ever-ending cycle and you're exhausted from it. And eventually what it leads you down to is this road of complete and total hopelessness. Because you don't realize it's Christ living with you, that dwells in you, that allows you to overcome this. And it's his grace that he's given you to overcome it. You don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to strive. You don't have to will your way through it. Because therefore, now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Again, I'm asking you this morning, are you in Christ Jesus? Are you in Christ Jesus? Jesus. Romans 3, 23 says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness 
Because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. That at the cross, when Jesus says it is finished, the payment of sin, debt that we owe, God fully satisfied in that moment. It was satisfied by the blood in which Jesus shed on Calvary. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it this way. God made him. Who? God made him, him being Jesus. Say Jesus. God made Jesus who was without sin to be sin for us that we would be made the righteousness of God. Listen, he takes our sin and we get credit for his righteousness. I want to let that sink in for a moment. Christ takes our sin And we get credit for his righteousness. Over here now, Christ takes our sin and we get credit for his righteousness. Over here, God takes our sin and we get credit for his righteousness. (laughs) Thanks be to God, our Lord Jesus Christ. He takes our sin and we get credit for his righteousness. His righteousness. It's as if you opened up your bank account right now and you, and you looked and you saw that you were trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars in debt. Can you imagine that for a moment? Like you owe $100 trillion. Not even Elon Musk can make enough money to pay off the trillions and trillions of dollars in which he would owe in that moment. And then a banker comes along and says, hey, listen, I've got all the resources available. I own everything. And what I want to do is I want to trade my bank account with your bank account. (laughs) That's what God does. He trades our sin, our debt with his righteousness. This is the great exchange. This is the gospel. This is what Christ did for us because now there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the good news that yet we were filthy rags, we were without hope and Christ came and he bestowed himself on the cross willingly and put himself at the center of ridicule and condemnation and walked a blameless life so that you and I can be free and free from our debt, free from the sin and there's no other way that we would be made whole and have a relationship Relationship with this perfect God other than his son. This is yet you free this morning. This is the great exchange. And this is my encouragement to you this morning. Set your eyes on Christ. Set your eyes on Christ. Not on sin management. Not on trying to make it happen on your own. Set your eyes on Christ. Keep your eyes, your attention on Christ. What does that mean, man? When you wake up in the morning, give your day to the Lord. Man, it starts right there. When you wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I give you this day. Lord, I give you this moment. I'm going to set my eyes on you today. I'm not going to look to the left or to the right if someone cuts me off in traffic on the way to work today. I'm not going to get frustrated. I'm going to keep my eyes, my attention, my focus on you today, Jesus. Set your eyes on Christ. Not the things of this world, not your flesh, not what you desire, not on money, not on power, but on Christ. Romans 8. Verse 10 says this, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You look at your life and say, it is impossible. 
impossible for me to overcome this, but it is impossible for you, but it's possible through Christ. The question is yet again, are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Are you fully, not just compartmentally, not just one area of your life, but is every part of you in Christ? Have you separated your life out just to be a Sunday morning Christian? Have you made one part of your life, yeah, God, you can have this, but I'm holding on to this. It's mine. It's my sin. I'm going to continue to do it. Are you in Christ? C.S. Lewis, in Mere Christianity, he writes this from God's perspective, and he says, give me all of you. I don't want so much of your time, so much of your talents and money and so much of your work. I want you, all of you. I have not come to torment or frustrate the natural man or woman, but to kill it. No half measures will do. I don't want to only prune a branch and a branch here, a branch there. Rather, I want the whole tree out. Hand it over to me the whole outfit, all of your desires, all of your wants and wishes and dreams, turn them over to me. Give yourself to me and I will make you a new self in my image. That's what God wants to do. He wants to make you into his image. He wants to transform you as you get into this word and as you dive in and realize, man, there's no condemnation. I can come boldly before Jesus every single day despite what I did yesterday, despite my sin, despite what I'm going through, despite my circumstances, I can come before the Lord and he can make me more into his image. Give me yourself in exchange, I will give you myself. My will shall become your will. My heart shall become your heart. Lord, Give us your heart. Give us your heart, God. That's my desire, that's my prayer for you today. That you would have the heart and the mind of Christ. Every part of you, not just a portion of you, but every part you would be in Christ. Are you in Christ? Jesus puts it this way in Revelation 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. He wants to dine with you. In the first century, there was nothing more intimate as far as relationship than sitting down and breaking bread with someone. What he wants to do is he wants to come in. He wants to dine with you. In every single moment, he wants to commune with you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to have fellowship with you and relationship with you. Will you receive this knock that the Lord is doing right now in your heart? every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray. I want to ask you right now in this moment, what area have you not fully given over to the Lord? 